Okay, now, that being said, let's get into the text for this week. And we're going to uh, continue the story we've been looking at in 1 Samuel, and we'll be in chapter 23, verse 1 today. So please join me there. 1 Samuel 23, 1. And as you're turning there, since Paul brought it up last week, that means I get to talk about it too. Those, those crazy races I do. Now, to tell you, I've learned a lot from doing those things. And, and it is my opinion that difficulty and struggle are excellent teachers. Time to think while you are uncomfortable is a very valuable thing for all of us. And too, too many of us spend too much time in comfort and not enough time in discomfort to learn the lessons we need to learn. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that negativity is cancer. If you are trying to accomplish something, something difficult, something great, if you let one negative thought in, it can lead to another and another and another until you spiral out of control and end up in a train wreck. The best way to avoid the train wreck is to not allow negative thoughts to get a root in your brain. you got to get rid of it as soon as it pops up. And in that race that Paul talked about last week to you, he was big time into negativity. As he, before this picture was taken, as he was laying on his side on the mountain with his legs all cramped up so much that he couldn't move them. And I am positive that in that race, Paul had thoughts of quitting. But Paul had with him in that race a crazy brother <laughs> to pull him out of the weeds of negativity and across the finish line, which is what I actually think you see happening in that picture is me yanking you across the finish line. Have you noticed that, though? People usually fall into one of two categories. People very rarely are neutral. Almost always, people are either people who build each other up or people who pull each other down. Have you noticed that? People build each other up or they're weights that weigh other people down. So... Back to the negativity thing. If we are going to accomplish great things, if we're going to live our lives for God well, effectively, we need to surround ourselves with people who build us up. And we need to be people who drive out negativity, who build each other up, and who push each other to live our lives for God. So here's the question I have for you today. Do you surround yourself with people who build you up and push you to follow God, or do you surround yourself with people who pull you down? And maybe even a, a, a secondary question that may be even more important than the first one, are you a person who builds others up and encourages them to follow God, or are you the kind of person who drags others down? Well, the fact that people are either builders or draggers is not a new thing. In fact, it shows up in this week's text. So if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1, it says, When David was told, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Kila and are rooting the threshing floors, he inquired of Yahweh, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? Yahweh answered him, Go, attack the Philistines, and save Kyla. So you'll remember, hopefully, that David ran away from Saul and went to the Philistine town of Gath. And we saw this, it was a dumb move on David's part. He wasn't trusting God, so he did stupid things, like going to the town of his enemy, the town of the enemy of where the giant was from that he had famously killed, and he went there wearing the giant who he'd killed sword, and it was a dumb thing. And in order to get himself out of that dumb situation, because he distrusted God that he got himself into, David acted crazy, and he managed to leave. He left Gath, and he stayed at the cave of Adullam, where 400 misfits and disgruntled men 
it's hard to know how to describe them, joined him. And then they moved to the forest of Hereth in Judah. And David's story shows us that on our own, when we distrust God, we do stupid things. But his story also shows us that others around us can drag us down and push us to not trust God and do stupid things as well. So here in chapter 23, David received word that the Philistines were attacking Kila, which is an Israelite town near where David is. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how David found out, but it's likely that the people of the town came to David for aid. And they came and told David that the Philistines were stealing the grain after all the work was done for the harvest and to prepare it, and they were fighting against the town. Now, I have to ask you, does any of that strike you as odd? Why do they tell David? Is it David's job to protect the towns of Israel? Or doesn't that fall under the authority and the responsibility of, I don't know, the king? Why don't they go to him? You see, the king is not doing his job as king, so the man who would be king is called on to do it instead. So since Saul is not acting like a king, David is given the opportunity to show himself to be kingly. And when he finds out, David asks God what to do. He inquired of Yahweh, shall I go attack these Philistines? And hold hold on, wait, 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 stop. Stop reading, wait, wait there, stop a minute. Do any of you remember the sermon that Paul preached to you one week ago? Do you remember how we saw David not trust God and not follow God and instead do stupid things? Well, why in this story is David's first reaction to ask God? What has changed between last week's sermon and this week's sermon? Well, first off, remember that David is a man whose desire is to follow God. He, he, he gets shaken, he messes up a lot, but what David really wants is to follow God. And also remember that the section of Scripture that we, remember the section of Scripture we scripted over, okay? We covered it two weeks ago, and then we skipped over it to get here. It happens between last week's sermon and this week. Those, remember, those 400 merry men come to David in the forest, or at the cave, and then they go to the forest. But also remember that among those people who gathered to David were two very important men, Gad the prophet and Abathar the priest. In fact, the only priest who's left because Saul has killed all the rest of them. So, the difference we see in David is in large part because now he has two godly men encouraging him to stay true to Yahweh. What we see, the difference between the stories here, is the power of encouragers in someone's life. They help David stay on course. And in fact, Abathar being there is the reason why David can inquire of God the way he does. Because verse 6 tells us that Abathar brought with him the ephod. And this is very important because the ephod contained the Urim and the Thummim, which were the, the devices that were used to determine the will of God in ancient Israel. And Abathar brought that with him to David. And I just want to say at this point, of course Abathar did. It, of course, leaves Saul without any way of determining what the will of God is, but Saul isn't listening to God anyway. He's not even seeking the will of God, so it doesn't matter to Saul that he didn't have the ephod. But also remember that Abathar is the only priest left. So the ephod and hearing the will of God is now his sole responsibility. So, of course, he has the ephod with him. And we know that David is listening to these two godly influences because he moved his force from the cave to the forest in Judah at the direction of Gad the prophet. 
So when David found out about Kyla, strengthened by the presence of Gad and Abathar, David did the right thing and seeks God's will. And God told David to go save the city. The man who is king won't do it. So God told the man who's going to be king to perform the kingly duties instead. But, like I said, people fall into two categories, one of two categories. Gad and Abathar were encouraging David. But when the men who were with David found out, they say, verse 3, here in Judah we are afraid. How much more then if we go to Kila and attack the, go against the Philistine forces? So here we have some draggers. But remember, of course, who these men were. They were in distress. They were in debt. They were, they were dis, discontented with the king. They were, in fact, the reason reason they came to David is because they were running away. They weren't really comfortable with going back to Judah when Gad said to. They didn't really like that decision. And this is even further over the line. Saving Kyla meant not only going back and making themselves more obvious in a place they were trying to get away from, also it meant making enemies of the nation on the other side, the Philistines. What David wanted to do was sandwich themselves between a nation who does hate them and a nation who is going to hate them. Also, also, remember that David only had 400 men. Not exactly an overwhelming fighting force. They are putting themselves between a rock and a hard place and all of that without even enough men to do it. So they didn't like the idea. So verse 4 says, Once again, David inquired of Yahweh. So David asked God again. And I'm sure you all want to give David a pat on the back for his actions here. He goes to God. He did the right thing. Uh, It is the right thing to seek God's will. But let me ask you this. Why does David ask God again? He already asked God. God gave the plan. So why does David go back and ask God again? Well, what we see here is the influencers of the influence of encouragers and draggers. David heard God's word. He had Abathar and Gad saying, "Go get them. Follow God. God says go get them." But then the men drag him down, and compromise his faith. So he asks God again. And let me clearly say to you that when this happens, when, when you or other people in your life drag you down and shake your faith or shake your trust in God, it is the right answer to recenter your focus on God. So good job, David. But also, don't miss how powerful the influence of an encourager or a dragger can be in life. I mean, look how powerfully they affect the man after God's own heart. And verse 4 continues, Yahweh answered him, Go to Kila, for I am giving the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Kila, fought the Philistines, and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Kila. So when David asked God the same question, God gives the same answer. Duh. And this time, God even gives David a little extra encouragement. He says that they're going to be successful. So shaky David is now back on course. And it is a very good thing that David had uh, Gad and Abathar there. His trust in God is restored, and the second time, he doesn't even give the men the option of negativity. He just says, hey boys, let's go. And they follow his lead this time, and they go down to Kyla, and they kick some Philistine bootay. And they save the city. Sometimes, just a few people really trusting God can motivate a whole group to follow God greatly. So we need to be those people trusting and following God. But the story doesn't end there. Verse 7 says, 
Saul was told that David had gone to Kilah. And he said, God has handed him over to me, for David has imprisoned himself by entering a town with gates and bars. And Saul called up all his forces for battle to go down to Kilah to besiege David and his men. So Saul heard what happened. And his reaction was to celebrate, saying that God had trapped David in the city so Saul could get him. He says that the, there's only a couple ways in and out of the town, so David's trapped. And then the Bible says that Saul called all his forces for battle to lay siege to Kila and get David. Don't miss King Saul here. King Saul would not lift a finger to save the town, but to get David, he mobilizes all his forces. And he intends to get David by laying siege to the city. He's going to surround the city and make the people of the city suffer so much that they capture David and hand him over. What a great king. Sarcasm. He won't help them, but he'll make them suffer to get what he wants. It actually sounds a lot like what God warned them would happen when they asked for a king. And I, I won't ask you how our government follows that pattern. We'll leave that one aside for now. But watch David's response at this point in the story. Verse 9 says, When David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abathar the priest, Bring the ephod. David said, O Yahweh, God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Kilah and destroy the town on account of me. Will the citizens of Kilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Yahweh, God of Israel, tell your servant. And Yahweh said, He will. And David asked, again, David asked, Will the citizens of Kilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And Yahweh said, They will. Look what David did. He immediately goes to the positive influence, Abathar, and asks God about the situation. This is smart on David's part. Go to the encourager and go talk to God. And from God, David found out that Saul was going to come to Kilah to get him. And God told David that the people of Kilah would, in fact, turn him over to Saul. And at this point in the story, let me say, those dirty little jerks. <laughs> Saul wouldn't help them. He's coming to make them suffer in order to get his way. David put himself in danger. He saved the city from the Philistines, and now they're going to stab David in the back. What a bunch of jerks. And there are scholars at this point in the story who will tell you there's a problem here. Because God says Saul's coming and that the people of the city are going to surrender him over. And neither of those things actually end up happening because David leaves. And therefore, God isn't trustworthy because God prophesies a lie. God is able to tell you what would happen if things go a certain way, even if they don't end up going that way. So don't worry about that. But verse 13 says, So David and his men, about 600 in number. Ooh, David's getting more men. 600 in number, left Kilah and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Kilah, he did not go there. David stayed in the desert strongholds in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. Foiled again. <laughs> David escaped from King Saul because God was protecting David. And David kept his men moving from place to place, and Saul can't find him. Now, what we see in this story is God taking David, who has been wrecked by life, who has lost his solid foundation in trusting God, and because he stopped trusting God, he's doing dumb things. We see God taking David and place, at, a, at a place in his life when he is utterly shaken and he, he, with, with saliva and snot in his beard. And God placing around David positive influences to bring David back to trust in God. And we see that there are still things and people in David's life that try to drag him down and pull him, pull him away 
from trusting God. But the influence, but the influence of those good influencers around him keeps David solid in trust and keeps David solid in following God. That is the effect of an encourager in a life. And the same is true for each and every one of us. Spoiler alert. Bad things will happen in your life. Events will unfold that make you want to quit. You may feel like you're in the middle of a Spartan race with your eyes all allergied shut and your nose running down your face and your legs cramping and you feel like you can't go on. All of us will face moments in life like that. And I know I just made a teasing reference about Paul in those moments, but those times happen in your life, and when they do, they are no joke. You lose a job. A loved one dies. Health pro- a, a, medical, a devastating medical diagnosis. You have marital strife. A child that you love is living away from God. Your house burns down. Interpersonal conflict. And many of you are experiencing those things right now. It is no joke. It is rough when the events of life make you want to quit. But the important question is, what will you do next? Will you recenter yourself to trusting God? When life knocks you down and beats you into the ground, and every time you even think about lifting your face, life grounds your face back into the dirt. Will you get back up and keep trusting God? Trusting God is the only way to move forward through those times in life. And we all have them. Jesus said, In this world, you will have trouble. And boy, how do we have trouble? But, he said, take heart. It means take courage. Be strengthened, he said, because I have overcome the world. Jesus doesn't deny that we will have difficulty. Even extremely difficult, faith-shaking times in our lives. He doesn't deny that. But the only right way to walk through those times, to survive those times, is to keep holding on to trust in God. Keep holding on to trust in God. And we can help ourselves out with holding on to trust. We can do this in a major way. We can give ourselves a big advantage in this, in trusting God, trusting God through the pain of life by what we saw in the story today. Listen to the voices that surround you. Are they ones that build you up or ones that drag you down? If you are surrounded by voices that are negative, always complaining, always distrustful, if you're surrounded by people that tell you to give up, or probably more likely not give up but take the easy way out, you know, not follow all of God's word, voices that say, Life is so difficult, following all of what God says, that's not important, just follow some of it, follow the easy parts. If you are surrounded by voices that are the voices of fear and distrust and negativity, get away from them. Whoever they are, don't let those voices in because negativity is cancer. Distrust is gangrene. Fear is rot. If you let those in, they will fester and grow and lead you into a train wreck. Surround yourself with people who don't deny the difficulty in life, but who at the same time push you to keep going. When Paul was cramping at that Spartan race and had to stop on the side of the mountain, He and I worked out a deal. When he had to stop and lay down, I started counting out loud. 
And when I got to 30, he and I both knew that he was standing up and we were moving up the mountain until he had to stop again. And then I'd start counting again. Surround yourself with that. With voices that tell you, you can make it through. That God is faithful then, now, and in the future. Surround yourself with people who push you to be all that you can be for God. Who help you take heart. Who remind you that Jesus is greater than anything and everything that you are facing. That's how you get through. Surround yourself with people who encourage you to be every bit of the person God wants you to be. And maybe even more importantly, be the type of person who encourages others to trust in God. Don't be like David's men. Don't be the type of person who cuts people off at the knees who are trying to trust God who are struggling in their life. Hear me in this. If you see your brother or sister struggling, do not tell them that it is okay to abandon following God. If they are struggling, if they are in pain, if they're suffering because of life, and they're just trying to keep their head above water, but they are still clinging to trust in God and trying to follow Him, you do not help them by telling them to stop clinging so hard to what they feel God is telling them to do. When you hear that in a friend, listen to that seed of faith in the midst of their pain and help it to grow. Encourage them not to focus on the pain because negativity is cancer, but instead commend them for their faith and trust in God in continuing, even in the midst of the pain, to hold on to him even if you don't fully understand their struggle. A lot of the time, we try to comfort or console our suffering brothers and sisters, but in doing so, we drag them away from trusting and following God. Maybe because we see them suffering and in pain and we feel that it, it, it's a little mean to, to push. We must be about building each other up, not dragging each other down. It is our job to push each other to trust God more and to be all that we can be in him. If, if you want to use Bible language for what I just said, we must hold unswervingly to the faith we profess because God who promised is faithful. And we must spur each other toward good, to faith and love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, but encouraging each other. That's Hebrews 10, 25. And by the way, that last part, not giving up meaning, that means that if you're struggling, you need to be here because this is where the encouragers are. It is devastating the effect that we can have on others when we purposefully or unintendingly drag them away from trusting God. It's devastating. But... It is even more powerful and more amazing the effect that one person encouraging a brother or sister can have in their life. Remember that for the next story when Jonathan comes to visit David. We see the effects of an encourager and the effects of draggers on David in this section of Scripture. But importantly... We need to begin seeing the effects of encouraging each other and pushing each other toward God and living well for him in our own lives. So today, right now, become a person who helps others be all they can be for God.